Welcome to the NCDWI Guy podcast, where defenders of the Constitution assemble to prepare for courtroom battle, and firm owners gather to develop marketing strategies that will revolutionize the practice of criminal defense. Here's your host, the NCDWI Guy, Jake Minnick. Hello, fellow freedom fighters, and welcome to episode 88 of the NCDWI Guy podcast. On today's episode, we have a very special guest. Dan Girl is joining us on the podcast today. He's got more than 15 years of experience fighting DWIs, both on the prosecution and on the defense end of things, and has also created a really, really great law practice in Washington. Uh, we're going to talk about the size and how you scaled to the to the point that you're at uh, now now Dan. But um, yeah, just kind of kind of want to dive in and maybe let you introduce yourself in terms of uh, where you guys have come from and what what you are now. Thank you, uh, thanks James, and thank you for your your kind uh, words. Uh, I'm happy to uh, to be a part of your podcast. So um, my name is Dan Garrell. I'm the uh, founder and CEO, managing partner of Puget Law Group. We are located in Western Washington State in what's called the Puget Sound area. Um, I started my practice about going on nine years ago as a solo, uh, right around 2017, I would say, we kind of hit our stride. Uh, we went from two attorneys to three and then four. In 2019, I uh, ended up uh, teaming up with uh, three other uh, guys are kind of high profile in different areas. We then became a partnership. Since then, we've we've grown, I, I guess you could kind of say it exponentially, to where we now have uh, 11 attorneys, including myself, as well as about uh, 15 or 16 staff people. So we're about 27 people strong right now. Yeah, that's amazing. And it, it's, it's a wild thing to see how quickly that growth has taken off. When you guys sat down and decided that a partnership would be, you know, a, a good, a good setup, and that you you each kind of had your own niches, but that being kind of uh, uh, two heads are better than one approach, was that something that you already had laid out in terms of the growth, or did that kind of happen organically after after forming that part partnership? What did that look like? That's a really good question. Uh, there was probably a little bit of that that uh, that I kind of had in mind, but certainly not nearly to the degree that things turned out. And and I that's kind of what I would like to anticipate moving down the road. That every every time we get maybe two years down the road and we look back, whatever we were thinking we were going to do two years before, we've 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 gone you know beyond that. That's kind of my goal. I would say, uh, insofar as I wanted to. Uh, dominate uh, in our market uh, in in a number of different areas. Uh, that was probably behind the uh, the move to partner uh, with some of the other uh, guys that I did. So uh, one of them I had already hired on uh, uh, as a uh, as a senior level uh, felony defense attorney. And that was about uh, maybe 2018. At that point, I, I had been growing, but I had not. Uh, I, I was dealing with some growing pains because some of the attorneys that I had working for me were were younger and less experienced, and I was kind of having to do uh, a lot of damage control. And it really wasn't any fault of theirs. It was just you know kind of putting them, in, uh, I guess, in the deep end. Um, when one of them moved on to a different job, I had an opportunity to hire. Uh, a guy who I'd known in the area here for several years who had been doing criminal defense uh, probably longer than me actually had been because I knew him when I was a prosecutor. Uh, and I knew that if I had somebody like that on my team, I not only would I not have to worry about uh, managing the, the client end of things, because here's somebody who's got a lot more experience and had a really good reputation and was really good with clients, but also somebody that I could kind of start to build some brand upon their experience and their, and their, uh, uh, you know, their profile in the legal community. Uh, so we, I hired him and then uh, about six months later, stumbled upon, ran into a, another attorney in the area who I'd been friends with for some time, who was a partner at another firm. I had been looking to get a PI practice off the ground. I had done a little bit of personal injury, um, but I, I, you can't do a little bit of personal injury. Uh, no, not, can't. I, 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 can't. <laughs> can't, I totally agree without getting in a lot of trouble or potentially. And I knew if I'm gonna do this, I've gotta have somebody who can be dedicated to it and who knows that. Um, and uh, and in search of somebody to do that, uh, it just so happened uh, this friend of mine, uh, Casey, who's one of my partners today, 
uh, was kind of looking for a change as well. Um, now he was already a partner, so it wasn't, a, for him, it wasn't a simple matter of just coming and working for me. So he proposed a, a partnership and it didn't take me very long to realize that that was in my best interest, that I've never been this person who is fixated on having my name on the door or fixated by having complete ownership or really even complete control. If I can be uh, at the helm and leading something where others have input um, and others have equity, but the, the sum of what we have uh, not only gives us something much greater, but even myself much greater. Uh, I have no problem letting go of this, you know, me versus us. I, I like working as part of a team. Uh, I, to- I, actually- I totally agree with that. I, I think that the, uh, the ego can get in the way of a lot of fun if you've got the right people around you. I, I think that one of the things that you said that really stuck out of me, because it's, it's something that I think a lot of attorneys that are trying to go from, you know, one, one, uh, uh, person firm to, you know, two or three or adding, you know, the, the next associate really struggle with who do I hire? Do I hire somebody with experience or do I hire somebody out of law school? And I don't think that there's a perfect answer to that question. I think for us, it's been dependent on the market that we're going into and the caseload that is going to be expected. So in newer markets that we're expanding into, sometimes we've, uh, hired somebody that is fresh out of law school to try to kind of develop, um, you know, the branding to, to kind of get up to speed, but where you have somebody that is taking over an active caseload, I really do think that experience comes into, to play in a major way. So to recognize, I think in your case, um, somebody that can kind of come in and, and really, really hit the ground running, so to speak is, is something that has, um, you know, definitely been part of our thought process with, uh, with taking over an active caseload. And that's always a challenging thing to bring somebody else in to really kind of maybe uh, handle some of the cases that you were previously handling. So what, what, specifically on that front, in terms of, of uh, your hiring process at the firm, you know, years of experience, or does it depend on the practice area? What, what advice or tips do you give on that? Because that's something that I think a lot of lawyers really struggle with is how do we get, you know, the, the, how, do, how do I get my associate to kind of take over my caseload to, to, to be productive at the office? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of this is uh, stuff that you know, I've learned over the last you know, three or four years and and it's been a lot of trial by fire. You know, some of these things uh, yes. are lessons. That's the, be- uh, that's the best way to learn. Lessons very, very, um, you know, very... Uh, very painfully learned in some cases and, 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 and it continue, the challenge continues. And, and right now I, I realize we're at a point where, you know, um, I run the firm, but I don't consider myself necessarily the boss, uh, at least not uh, uh, as far as my, uh, my partner's concerned, but I am the leader. And, and, you know, I have uh, partners that, that, that not only need me to be in that role, they, they, they insist that I'm in that role because then, that there's no confusion over who who is providing the direction, um, and then they don't they don't get um, uh, other people kind of looking to them for the sort of direction that they know that that I'm setting their focus more because I don't at this point I don't handle cases, I don't have a caseload, uh, I don't I'm not I'm rarely in court. Uh, last year I was in court uh, for a week on jury duty, and other than that uh, I don't think I stepped foot in the courthouse uh, more than one once or twice last year. And that allows them to concentrate on what they're doing, personal injury, criminal defense. And so with that, what I would say is, you know, we, we are in need of uh, people to come in that are, that are either able to lead or are more than willing to be led. Um, uh, and, and that everybody understands our, you know, we have a vision, but we have a very specific uh, culture and personality and vision. And I, I go a little bit overboard when we're in the recruiting and hiring uh, process. I have some kind of rules that it, even some of my partners sometimes uh, are not so sure. It has to be uh, exactly what 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 I say it needs to be. But I make sure and let everybody know what they're in for if they're coming in on our team because we're fast moving, we're fast growing, and the, you know the, their opportunity to earn and to get those opportunities is something that they're not going to find anywhere else. Certainly not in the criminal defense space. Uh, on the other hand, this is not a job like like they're going to have anywhere else. Uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of spontaneity. There's you know we'll we'll go through a stretch where we'll have uh, eight, nine, ten uh, uh, K, uh, people hire us like with, within an afternoon, 
and and uh, there, there, it, it's it's really like a you never know exactly what's going to happen on a day to day basis. It's for me, it's 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 part of what I am willing to uh, deal with in order uh, to uh, to make choices and the decisions that are that I need to make for us to continue the growth that we've dedicated ourselves to. And then this is just one of those things that kind of comes with the territory. Um, if I if we in the past if we've hired people that don't really align with that, uh, whether they're at experience or just coming out of school, it's never a good outcome for them or for us. Um, and so I, I make it very clear. This is, this is you know, probably, I probably to the degree where I might go a little bit overboard, you know, uh, this is, uh, this is, this is who we are. And, 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 and what I'm, what I end up ultimately telling you should either excite you or it should scare you. Uh, and if it doesn't excite you, then, then you probably don't want to be here. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, I find that that does work. Um, uh, we, we tend to get more and more people coming on board that, that get it or, or they have approached us because they become familiar with us or they've learned about us. And that's why uh, that's why the conversation has started, because they've kind of reached out to us. So uh, I, I, I like to continue to kind of uh, do things in that direction. Yeah, I, th- I think that that honesty up front is so important. And I think a lot of times there are not honest conversations about what the job is going to entail because a attorney that is looking to make a hire so often on the first hire is doing so almost out of a point of need as to a point of growth. And so you need somebody to come in and start handling cases. You need somebody to come in and start taking these calls. And when you're hiring out of need, you have to uh, sell yourself, right? Or maybe even almost oversell yourself because you need this person that you think is the right candidate to come in and start working. Whereas if you're looking for the right team member, whether that's the first person on the team or the 10th per- person on the team, and you, you say, hey, here's what our culture looks like. Here's what the day-to-day is going to look like. And, and like you said, present it to them in this, this place of, okay, well, this is either going to excite you or going to, going to cause you a lot of anxiety. Better to be upfront and learn that this is not going to be a good fit before you have to figure out payroll and spend you know, a month in you know, pretty extensive training and do all of the other things and then have the person ultimately just not be satisfied and leave anyway. So I, I think that that real honest upfront conversation is, is so helpful to just keeping the culture the way that you want the culture to be, but also in terms of weeding out anybody that's really not interested. Yeah. And the one thing I would add also, because we're, we're, we're kind of um, uh, potentially dealing with this uh, uh, in the not too distant future is have a, have it worked out, uh, uh, have an exit uh, plan for what happens when that attorney inevitably decides to move on. You know, so we, what we do um, uh, for our attorneys is that, you know, they make they, their compensation is a, is a mix of base salary and commission. And the commission is usually based upon what, you know, the matters that they sign up, that they represent, you know, where you are the attorney. I mean, they're a Puget Law Group client, but you are their attorney. And the expectation is that you sign it up, you pretty much uh, determined what the fee was going to be. Uh, and they see you as their attorney. <clears throat> if they have concerns or questions, or if, if, you, if, if you're having some difficulty in the communication, you know, th- their next move is not, well, I need to talk to your boss, right? Their next move is they see you as the person that they're, that they're going to have to work this out. It should, you know, you can always come to me if you need help or if you have questions, but, but that thing should, you, sh- you need to be able to resolve that in order for, in order for that commission to have earned. Uh, and, and so uh, I don't know what it's like in, uh, in uh, North Carolina, but, you know, in Washington state, if somebody, uh, if an attorney leaves a firm under the rules of ethics, the client gets to decide who will continue yes. to represent them. Now, if that attorney is moving on to get out of the legal profession or to go work at a public defender's office, my, my guess would be that you know, the decision has more or less already been made. Uh, on the other hand, if they're going out on their own or they're going to work for another, uh, another firm, um, you know, uh, that client could make the decision that they want to go with it. Well, then what happens as far as, you know, the, the commission plan, what happens as far as compensation when that attorney moves on and this client goes with them, but they've already paid our firm. These are all things that, uh, that, that you should think about uh, in advance and then have a policy and make sure that they understand that coming in because you don't want to try to hammer that out uh, 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 as the person is on their way out. Um, uh, again, things that we've learned um, uh, uh, from past experiences 
and things that uh, as time goes on and we hit another uh, event, uh, sometimes uh, we have to kind of uh, improvise a little bit based on what we already had in place. You, you can never think every detail through until you until you run into it. But the more the more you can kind of uh, uh, plan for things, obviously, the better. Yeah, I totally agree with that. In, in terms of your in terms of your rebranding that you did a couple of years back and moving from Daryl uh, Law to uh, Puget Law Group, what was what was what did that look like in terms of you know uh, conversation about that transition? What was your kind of thought process in ter- terms of the benefits of doing that? Because that's obviously a pretty major thing, and you know, I assume that maybe could you restart over uh, uh, from day one? Maybe you would pick a non, um, you know, non name. We, we've talked about recently at our practice uh, rebranding to from Minic Law to more of a DWI generic practice name. Um, and I've got I've got equity partners at the firm as well, so it's kind of that symbolism that this is not just you know my you know my, my name that's on the door but also um you know what what you stand for what you're you know building your building your brand but what did that what did that look like and for people that might be starting a law firm why would you maybe advocate uh going away from kind of a, a named practice so the reasons why I did it would be different than why I would do it now or what I would advise somebody coming out of school um I did it for a, a number of reasons first of all I, 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 and I'm, I, I'm speaking in terms of marketability and branding. I have a terrible last name. I, <laughs> it, it couldn't be worse. Even you did, you didn't pronounce it correctly at the beginning <laughs> because nobody would look at it and pronounce it correctly without knowing it's Garrel. Uh, so if you hear it and then you try to spell it, you're not going to spell it the way it's spelled. And if yeah. you read it, you're not going to say it the way that it, it, it is pronounced. It's, and it's just, you know, it's, it's a, it's a one syllable, uh, you know, it doesn't have a, it doesn't have an impact mimic. That's got some, that's got some, that's got some tooth to it. My name is, my name is horrible. Uh, so, so I had, I had zero, zero um, uh, problems uh, moving away from it just for that reason. And I also, and, and I didn't have a name, you know, I went from being a prosecutor for five years <clears throat> to then working uh, for three years for a personal injury firm where I developed their criminal uh, defense area. So after three years, I developed a little bit of a reputation and a name, but, but, but I was under their brand, you know, so I still had, didn't have a chance to, to put my name on any sort of, you know, uh, logo or whatever. So when I did it, and again, not, not already not being the kind of person that necessarily wanted to see my name in print, uh, previous to being an attorney, I was a graphic designer and I worked in, uh, in marketing, I worked in advertising and it's funny because I remember at the time I had my own, my own graphic design practice and I, I, I had a name for it. I didn't call it Dan Garrell Design. I, it was almost similar to what I see with law firms. Yes. It was always James Minnick Design. I always thought yeah. how boring that was. I never had any, never wanted to see my name, although I did, want to, I did want to see the thing that I created, that name being out there. So I think about three or four years in, I just thought, you know, I want I want to create something that sounds a little bit bigger and a little bit a little bit broader with a little bit more gravitas. And so, you know, uh, Puget Law, Puget Sound being the area that we're in, I went with Puget Law Group. Um, and I do believe that 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 um, uh, I do think that that uh, uh, paid some dividends because I, I can track our to kind of the upswing of our growth to not not long after I made that change. Now I will say I will say this. If anybody does that now, and they people probably know this, I was pretty naive. There's a way you got to do it. If you're on yes. Google, Google bit don't don't do it. I mean, unless you're really a, an expert on that, find somebody who knows that to help you out with that. Because the the way I did it, we basically fell off of Google for two months, and, and I was doing pretty good as far as the paid ads and things like that. I screwed it up, and I and I, the phone didn't ring for two months. Unfortunately. Uh, the person that I did find to kind of help me out with that, who to this day I work with, uh, did know what I did wrong and why and, and what he could do to get us back in the indexes and things like that. That's all stuff that's way over my head. Um, and, and so, uh, but me being prob- a little bit more knowledgeable about a lot of that stuff than your average attorney, they, they, you, they could really uh, screw up because they wouldn't even know who to turn to, 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 kind, of, uh, to kind of solve that. Um, but yeah, I do, I do think that that, 
uh, I do think that that was important. Um, and, uh, and what I would say to somebody coming out now is I would say, you know, if exactly what you said, you know, I'm sure that you are hearing the same things that I'm hearing about, about, about the, the not, not the possibility. I think the inevitability of, of non-attorneys coming into ownership in, yeah. in, in, in the legal field. I mean, it's coming, you and I are engaged in a lot of things through Chris and, and I imagine through some other uh, outlets where we're getting that information. And, and most of the people that are, are uh, most of our colleagues and our counterparts, they're not, they don't even have that information. Uh, it's not, it's not coming to them. Uh, and it's going to, it's going to transform what we're doing. And I think that if you're just out there with your name, especially if you're just coming out of school or maybe even practicing for three or four years now, and you're going out, that name is going to have, it's going to have nothing. And even if you were able to build a successful practice, if at some point you wanted to scale it and you wanted to get to a point where potentially it had some value, you wanted to sell it, anything that is directly connected to you, it has no value without you. Right. You know? So, so everything, I think, you know, you, you got to look at this as a business and, and I'm by no means a, a business expert. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't have any sort of business education at all. Um, it's just kind of an awareness and, and, and the willingness to understand that, you know, if you're not approaching this, uh, as, as a business, if you continue to, to keep, you know, kind of keep saying narrow minded and listen to the old people, the old, the old practitioners that are going to be retiring in the next few years, you're telling you, this is a, this is a, uh, you know, uh, this is a practice. It's not a business. I mean, you're just, you're not doing yourself any favors. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that the, the big challenge in having that kind of name change, you know, five or 10 years in is that it requires a massive amount of kind of thought about how to rebrand, how to make sure that your website then is going to get renamed. If your domain name is, is renamed, how that's going to impact your email addresses and um, uh, SEO value and, and Google ranking, like you had just mentioned. So, you know, it's, even though it's kind of like, well, right now I'm just a one man show. What's the difference if, if I want to, you know, go a couple of years of practice before, trying to kind of brand myself into something bigger, it's going to be a lot more headache doing that two or three years down the road than it's going to be to, to start out, you know, right at square one with that name brand presence of what it is that you're trying to, to communicate to your, to your potential clients. So I, I, I agree. I think that just doing that at the early stage of things, that's one of the reasons why we're being kind of slow on our end about that right now, because we've been talking about it for over two years is just trying to logistically think through every single part of what would be impacted by a, a brand name change and how are you know prior clients going to find us? How are we going to be able to, to post this out into the um, uh, you know a Google brain and make sure that that doesn't get mixed up? All that kind of stuff plays plays into it. So I think that that's really important. Um, in, in terms of you, you know kind of your, your scaling, your practice, and kind of uh, growing. What what at what point did you decide? You know, I'm I'm no longer going to uh, kind of represent clients in the courtroom and try to grow the business. What, what what was was that a moment? Was that you know several years? What did that look like in terms of deciding I need to kind of spend 100 percent of my time leading my organization and working on my business? I think it probably, I think it kind of got its, its, its initial push to kind of scale it down. Um, <clears throat> when I hired uh, the attorney that had been practicing uh, in, in our, uh, in our community for a while, I got on, a, you know, this guy who had more experience at that than me, uh, who I knew uh, I could entrust. Uh, I didn't have to worry about, you know, clients uh, complaining about uh, the attorney that didn't seem like they knew what they were doing. So that, that kind of allowed me, uh, not only did that take uh, up a lot of the case, so it allowed me to just kind of step back and focus on, uh, you know, just the, <clears throat> just the, um, uh, you know, the brand development. And then w when we partnered up, um, it was a, it was a, it was a conscious decision that we made as a, as a firm that I was going to get out of, of uh, having a caseload and that I was going to uh, specifically, you know, run the firm. So I, I was, it, the good thing was that I had, I had partners that, that saw the value in that and partners that knew that uh, as, you know, as long as I was doing what I was doing, which was going to help us grow, which is going to let me focus on our marketing and focus on our business development. That was going to uh, uh, all, you know, all but ensure that we were going to have a good steady 
um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, influx of of new clients coming in. So they didn't have to, so that would keep it, that would keep them from having to worry about uh, how do we know that, that the phone's going to keep ringing and then, uh, and then know that they would, they could just focus just on uh, handling the cases. So, yeah. I think, you know. I think that's really, I mean, again, I think some of that, that, you know, becomes organic and then at some point you get strategic about it, but you know, in, in terms of, of moving in that direction, I really think that one of the one of the biggest hangups to to growing is that time that you kind of spend in the courtroom working on client cases because it just requires such a high, uh, you know, a high attention. Um, you know, what wh- what did you kind of experience in terms of once you once you stepped out of the courtroom? Was was the difficulty in stepping out of the courtroom because you were concerned about uh, clients? Um, how they were going to be represented without you kind of in the courtroom with them, or was it more, you know, just difficulty in terms of making that, that transition? Cause for me, I, I just kind of thought, you know, that, that, that it would just be too, too big of a step to pass this off. I, I kind of even knew that I wasn't the, 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 the person that was best equipped to help clients in the courtroom, that there's other attorneys that are honestly just better attorneys in terms of representing clients, but it was just that kind of, I don't know how I'm going to, Past the, past the baton, and I'm still kind of in the process of fully making that happen. But it made made some some pretty major strides in terms of getting out of the courtroom. And every time that I see, you know, the the attorney that's kind of taking over most of my caseload in the courtroom working on a case, it's like, man, my client is just way better served by me being out of the way. So what what, what were some of those obstacles in uh, in your case? Well, to be honest with you, I didn't really have once once we were at that point. I really didn't have to deal with those obstacles because, you know, between um, uh, the, the 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 attorney that I hired initially, uh, who again I had more experience and was more well known as a as a as an as a defense attorney in the in our in our market, uh, Casey, my partner that I brought on um, and 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 started, uh, you know, the three of us then partnered. And then six months later, we brought another uh, guy in who who had been the chief criminal prosecutor uh, in the in, in the county where we're located right now. Nobody would, you know. And and again, I I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty uh, low um, uh, low uh, low ego in this. Uh, nobody would would look at that as me and then three guys. They, they, right. They, these guys are all entities on their own. Right. That makes uh, sense. I, I never had an issue. And, 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 you know, even today, you know, I, I do, I, every once in a while, I will sign people up. I'll answer a phone. I'll walk them through and I get to, I get to, uh, I guess, sell it as I run this firm. This is the team that I put together. These guys are the best at what they do, the better at it than me, because I'm the best at what I do within our firm. And so, you know, anytime you, and that's really the job of a leader, I think, right. is, to, is to put people in place that are better at what they do than, than you are. And so um, I, I consider myself the best leader. I don't need to be the best DUI attorney or the best uh, uh, this or that. I, I do think I'm a, a good attorney, um, uh, but, you know, uh, I'm, this, is, this is what I'm best at. So for me, uh, at least once I got to that point where I made that first decision that that was kind of a gut check, you know, bringing somebody on who I knew I was going to have to pay six figures to, um, you know, that, that was, that was daunting, but I just, I knew if I'm going to take that next step, I'm going to have to do this. And it, and it certainly paid off from, from that point. That's, it's never been a, it's never been a concern. And like I said, they're more than happy to have me be in this role, um, to have very limited involvement every once in a while, I might go cover something in court just because a couple of my attorneys are in trial. Um, but as far as actually handling the cases, there's no, uh, there's no such thing as, you know, be nice if Dan handled these. And I, I don't, I mean, there's certain parts of that that I miss, but there's a lot I don't miss. I don't right. miss, I don't miss, uh, you know, uh, we all know, you know, some of the difficulties that you deal with when you're, when you're an actual uh, attorney handling a client case. Look, I don't miss that. You know, I have my own things that I deal with that they don't, uh, but it's just, it's really just the best. And, and I think we're probably there's probably few, if any, firms that do what we do that have this, what I would consider to be kind of a luxury because you're right. I agree. I, I, yeah, I know a, a lot of the firms that are on that growth path where, where they, where whoever's running the show, he, he is, or she is in court a lot. And that's gotta be a tough thing to juggle. And, and I don't know how they do it. I don't think it generally it, they're able to do it as successfully as, as they would be able to lead the firm if they didn't have to do that, which is why I think we're, 
uh, we're, we're successful in what we're doing. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, your background in kind of graphic design and marketing, and then, you know, going, going through law school after that, um, you, you're clearly very concerned about uh, kind of constantly growing yourself, participating in, um, uh, you know, the, the CRISP coaching program, participating in you know, summits, you're at the CRISP summit a couple months ago. You're currently at another summit in Atlanta, uh, the uh, CEO lawyer summit, um, uh, you know, in Atlanta again. So you're flying back and forth across the country to make this a priority. When, when did that become a priority in terms of when you, when you left being a prosecutor into the, into the private um, world, at what point was it kind of like, I need to really kind of focus on branding and marketing and how to develop as a leader and how to develop my business? Was that always present? Did that kind of increase at a certain point? What did that, that process look like? So I would say the branding and the marketing has, has always been something that I knew was important and I knew was I was good at because of my background in advertising and, and, and graphic design. Uh, the leadership thing probably started becoming uh, more, important, uh, more important and more uh, understandable to me uh, ever, you know, after we started getting involved with Chris. You know, so back in 2019, I found uh, uh, Michael Mogill's book, um, uh, The Game-Changing Attorney. I was looking at it specifically for marketing uh, inspiration. Uh, I had kind of been thinking about the idea of video marketing, had not done any of that yet. Thought I'd get some good information out of that book. It ended up turning into, I want these guys to, to do this for us. So uh, we set about uh, hiring them to do our branding campaign. Right around the time that we finished all that was the, was the summit in uh, 2019 that I went to with a couple of my partners. And I think it was there that, that it hit me, you know, that, that, that we, we have the ability to do so much more. I, and we got involved with Chris Coaching. We signed up uh, for Chris Bex. And, and that's, that's, it's just taken off from there. And, uh, and I know that you have uh, some involvement uh, with Chris. So, yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's been very much a similar, similar thought process. I mean, you know, I think, you know, uh, always kind of an interest on the business side of things way, way back at the beginning of practice, I read uh, the E-Myth book. And so that had a major influence on, on uh, kind of expansion and growth. But really, the the Crisp uh, team, both through C Crisp coaching, through all of the summits, the videos that they that they did, kind of which was our our introduction to them as well, was um, a, a brand video. The way that they used that in this storytelling fashion, it was unlike any kind of attorney advertising that I'd ever seen on TV. The way that they presented things, and and you know, I, I feel like these kind of conferences. Um, you know, are really just kind of to try to get you to start thinking differently about your practice. You don't, you don't walk into the, to the Chris conference, in my opinion, and just, you know, walk out with this blueprint of everything exactly as you need to do it over the next 10 years to kind of grow to this 10 figure law firm. But it, it really, in these big, big uh, uh, kind of big picture idea, uh, starts to get that thought process moving of, you know, how can I, how can I improve my team? How can I improve my culture? How important is it to me to have hiring? It's, it's, it's more of this kind of, or for, this is my experience with it has been just this really eye-opening period of self-reflection of, man, I can, I just cannot believe, um, you know, all of the things that I wasn't thinking about. And then with the coaching program, whether it's through CRISP or anything else, you know, th then kind of deciding, well, here's what we're going to try. Here's what we're going to try different in terms of, of hiring to have an accountability um, uh, process built into your practice to, to you know, your day to day, you know, this accountability setup and structure that really is where I think the rubber meets the road is, is, is trying to find that accountability structure again, whether that's through their coaching program or through something else, um, you know, accountability is where, you know, where you see the milestones start to actually get hit. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, if, if, um, and I think you, you hit it on the head as far as they, they do a really good job of, of, kind of helping you discover who you are. Uh, I, I think without that, I, I don't know how, to what degree or how, or how uh, quickly we would have arrived at, at our formula of I'm, I'm kind of the, I'm kind of the, the, the ringleader. And then I've got these you know, partners who are, 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 you know, we're all kind of, you know, 
equal uh, share owners to a certain degree, but we have very different roles. And my role is one as leader and their roles are, are that as specialists. I think a lot of that came through the, the discovery process that we went through when we were, when we were producing those, those videos, because they, they're very good at, at getting you to tell your story in a way that you wouldn't necessarily tell it if it was just completely up to you. So the way that they kind of, I mean, they're not writing that for us, you know, it, it's, it's our story, but they're getting that, they're kind of drawing that out of you and drawing that out of me and out of, uh, out of the other guys. So, uh, but, but then we see it there and we realize, oh, wow, that, that, that's who we are. So I think yeah. that that was really huge in kind of uh, helping to kind of um, really, really kind of uh, polish that brand, uh, so to speak. So, yeah, I, I agree. That was a similar experience for us in terms of the branding video. I mean, we'd never had, you know, uh, really until the last couple of years, but definitely not when we did the brand video core values or brand promises, you know, a, a really good understanding of why we were doing what we were doing. And so they really help you kind of think through that and pull out all of that information um, in, in terms of, you know, kind of what they pulled out and what you guys have either intentionally or upon discovery figured out, maybe a good place for us to spend a couple of minutes would just be on culture, what does that look like at, at uh, your, at, you know, in, in terms of your team, what, what does the culture look like? And, and, you know, how have you been able to develop the culture at the office? You know, we, I think we're at a point now where the, the tide has definitely turned and people are really starting to get this thing that we're doing and that we're very passionate about as far as our vision and our, and our, I don't say a goal. I say like our promise to, you know, we're, we're on, we're, we are uh, on a mission to be the biggest and obviously best criminal defense, DUI defense firm in the Western United States uh, by 2025 uh, in order to uh, provide the, you know, the, what I consider to be the uh, superior uh, legal aid to as many people as we can. I mean, that, that's kind of, roughly how I would lay that out. It's not just, you know, we want to be the biggest and the best for no reason. And we could never get there unless we were in fact uh, the best at what we did because uh, the larger part of what's going to spread our name are our clients that are happy with what we're doing, who yes. write us reviews that people see and go, wow, you know, these guys are really setting themselves apart. So, you know, everything is, it's all, it's all kind of, uh, uh, it's all interlinked. Um, now that hasn't always been easy for the people on our team. Um, you know, a lot of the people that come that come on board or, or have come on board in the past have been, uh, uh, whether it be legal assistance or reception or a paralegal, uh, oftentimes they're coming because one of the prosecutors worked with them at the prosecutor's office. Um, and and they, they'll come with uh, probably a pretty good, uh, uh, a pretty good experience uh, level. Uh, but come from a completely different uh, work world and one that frankly couldn't be further than what I want to, to, uh, to create. You know, I was a prosecutor. Yeah. I was going to say, uh, that's probably helpful to kind of understand what the culture is on that side of things. Yeah. And if you're somebody who goes, I've been at the prosecutor's office for five years, I want to run like hell. away. From <laughs> then, then welcome. But if you come from there and, and the thing that, the thing that, the thing that uh, uh, attracted you to coming here, maybe you go, yeah, I've been there for a while and it's, it's pretty good. I'm looking for a bit of a change that again, that's where I go to, well, let me make sure you understand what you're in for, because that's a, that's kind of a tough adjustment for yes. a lot of people. And it has been, and I'm not, I'm talking about people that are, that are really good and really valued and are still part of our team, but it has taken a, a long time to kind of, and we're still kind of working on it. And, and, you know, the guy, this is a, this is a situation where the guy who's leading the, the firm, the team is not the best person to, to explain that. Because they're seeing it coming from, you know, the top and it can be and it can come off as very threatening and intimidating. You know, all these changes that I come back from uh, from a summit or a conference or something or a workshop and I'm all pumped about, you know, how hard we're going to hit it. it I mean, it, it's silly. I look back and, and think how silly it is that I thought that everybody would just immediately embrace that. And, and I'm confused why there's so much trepidation. And now I understand that. So what we what we do now is we've got uh, we've got uh, two or three of our team members that are enrolled in the uh, you know in the crisp experience program. So they're actually going to those things. They're the ones that come back and they're the ones that share all of that with the, with their team members. It's much more of a peer level thing and it's much more effective that way. Uh, and some of the people that were 
that, uh, that were kind of our, our um, you know, uh, you know, uh, again, some of our senior paralegals, people that were really, uh, uh, really uh, skilled positions, but also uh, really wary of what was going on. They and 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 very much more in a position of 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 kind of mentorship to the you know to the support staff. They're now having they're now finding uh, the value in that and going back and sharing it. And so that that message is getting through a lot better now. And we've just over the last year and a half or so, we've really I think. Um, We've really stepped it up in terms of knowing how how important it is to have this team, and therefore what what we need to be able as the owners to give for that effort. I mean, we pay our team. I'm confident as much or more as they're going to make anywhere else. And we have a 401k program, and we have full medical for everyone and their families. Our receptionist, uh, uh, if she has you know uh, 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 you know uh, dependents, that's all covered. Um, we have a we have a growth bonus program that's similar to a profit sharing thing, so that. Uh, you know, whatever our, our revenue number is, if we hit these targets, they're, they're getting some of that too. So the whole idea is for them to have buy-in. So we completely get away from this thing of, well, there's the owners and then there's yes. the attorneys and then there's us. And, and, uh, and, you know, and we do a lot of fun things on a monthly basis that, that, that are all intended to, to reward them and, and, and call them out for the great things that they've done at employee of the quarter for whom we donate a thousand dollars every quarter to the, to the nonprofit of their choice. And we just, you know, we're con- on my, my thing is I'm, I, I want to constantly be reaffirming how important they are and, and making them feel valued. And because I, I don't want people like that to, to go take a job somewhere else because it pays them 50 cents an hour more. Yeah, I, to- I totally agree. I think that uh, there's so much to unpack there, Dan, in terms of just different different things that are important to the culture and how you are getting buy-in from the team. I mean, one of the main things that I did poorly for such a long time is I'd read a business book or attend a summit and um, you know just come back with all this kind of exciting information and just anticipate that everybody else you know has already read the same book right like is you know it's, i'm not communicating anything new and it's like how come you know how come my team doesn't understand what we're trying to do in terms of you know the culture here and then when i you know did these like self reflections it's like well i don't even know what the culture here is about like if you asked me to like spell that out it would probably not come out in any type of coherent you know uh, thought thought processing about why we exist, who we're trying to serve, who our ideal client is, what our core values are. None of that stuff was laid out. And so I was like, well, dang, no wonder nobody else knows that. Cause first of all, I don't know. And secondly, I'm not communicating it to the team and, you know, just having those regular times where you are, you know, talking about your mission or your brand promises or your core values, whether that's, you know, on a daily basis or a weekly basis, however it is getting communicated to the team outside of the day-to-day, uh, you know, grind of cases and handling these things is so important. And uh, we, we uh, just took to the, um, the most recent CRISP summit, the, the whole team. So attorneys, staff, we took, we took everybody and, you know, it, d- it did two things. First of all, it revealed to everybody how much I was stealing. You know, it looked like I had uh, come up with all this good stuff on my own. It was very clear that I was just stealing everything from, uh, from crisp. So it, it made me out to be a fraud in front of my team, but <laughs> just, just kidding on that front. But, you know, in terms of, uh, in terms of the buy-in on their end, I really think it helped to communicate to the team, Hey, here's, you know, again, th- this is what we're trying to accomplish. This, this in kind of a big picture format is some of the things that we've been working on. It really helped people to understand, oh, that's why we're, that's why we're doing that thing because, you know, this, the, because of this larger picture in terms of how this fits into culture, how this fits into client service, the experience level that we're trying to provide. So I, th- yeah, I think that, you know, really making that culture aspect, the, uh, the client experience, something that everybody is a part of regularly hearing about has the ability to give feedback to is so powerful because the more you can give that ownership to your team, whether that's through, you know, actual kind of almost like profit sharing own ownership in the, in the business itself or ownership of a case, ownership of a problem, uh, you know, ownership of how to build the culture, the, the, the more you create that buy-in. So I think that that is just such a, a powerful thing in terms of how you guys are doing that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and again, we're, we're still not uh, where we, where we need to be, you know, uh, I still, uh, you know, when I, when I get that, 
that there is true um, uh, authentic ex excitement among uh, people on the team over the fact that we hit the Inc. 5000 for the third year in a row, not because I'm excited about it, but because they know, among other things, what that means is that, you know, uh, because they're a part of this, uh, this, this continuously growing, you know, uh, juggernaut that they're, that they're standing to gain, uh, you know, uh, revenue wise, as well as other things. That's, that's when I'll know that we've, we've kind of, uh, you know, made it clear. And, you know, we've got a, our team is, uh, is just, is very unique in that. Uh, and again, I just, I know that this isn't uh, the, the, the norm or, or, or even existent in any other uh, uh, you know, criminal defense firm where we've got somebody on our team, all she does is deal with, you know, uh, Department of Licensing matters for our DUI clients or, or uh, sending people out to get their alcohol evaluations and following up. And, they, and she's so much more knowledgeable and helpful and appreciated by them than any, than any of the attorneys would be. And they, right. as a result, are free to not deal with nearly as much of that as they used to, right? Or as a solo attorney has to, and it just it just creates such a, a much such a better overall experience for the client and in a product offering that we that we can that we can lay claim to. So that sort of thing is only possible because of the growth that that we're doing and the ability to put to have people focus on those roles. So they they do start to understand how important it is that we're growing in that way. It gives them more freedom to, to seek out areas that they would like to specialize in. Love it. Yeah. I, I think that that is, that is such a, such a good point. Again, I think, you know, for, for any person that is, is got something on their plate that they don't want to want to deal with, or, or, you know, you're not the best person at it. There's somebody out there that's great at it, whether that's communication, follow-up, uh, being organized, um, accounting, you know, uh, phone calls, whatever it might be, there's somebody out there that is, is ready, willing, and able to step up to the plate on that. When you've got that kind of team uh, aspect of, of, you know, this is the go-to person for this particular issue, it really is such a, a better experience on the client's end. So um, I, I, lo I love all that, Dan. Well, I, I know you've got to get back to the, uh, the CEO Lawyer Summit that you're attending and get so, some more great ideas to take back home with you, but really appreciate you sharing all your wisdom with us and having the opportunity to talk. I appreciate it. It's been an honor. If you found the information in this podcast to be valuable, I simply ask that you pay it forward and share this podcast with another member of the legal community. Also, if you would leave us a rating or a review on whatever platform you are listening on, I would greatly appreciate it.